Hi everyone. Um, once again, my name is Ryan Dickerson. I'm a student uh, at Brady School of Medicine, class of 2025, and we're bringing you this lecture on the brachial plexus. And this is being brought to you by the Scrubs Team, which is the Student Collaborative Resources for Understanding and Brady Success. So going through our mission statement one more time, um, Scrubs is a student-derived initiative that aims to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohorts that will pass through Birdie. And members of Scrubs, we participate in a variety of subcommittees that work on different resources for students by students. And these resources aim to give you a unique perspective of a student who has walked through the class, been through the class, and giving you resources that we wish we had been exposed to while we were in the course. So the hope is that this organization will become a part of the student body at Birdie, and it will exemplify our unique collaborative community. If this is a mission that aligns with your goals or something that you might be interested in the future, we invite you to join the team at the conclusion of the course. And quick disclaimer, the resources that are included in this video are made by students and not by faculty. So there is a possibility for errors, although we do try to mitigate this as much as possible via multiple stages of vetting. If there is at any point a contradiction within the coursework um, and what is being presented here, please go by your course documents. Additionally, this is a supplemental resource and is in no way a replacement of all of the material that you'll be given throughout the course and by instruction by Birdie faculty. Um, so use this as a resource, but not as your primary source of course material, as we cannot include all the material required in the course within this video series. All right, so getting into the actual brachial plexus, the brachial plexus is probably one of the most important chapters within your first exam unit at Birdie. So we're going to take some time to go through this and work through the different components of the brachial plexus in a good amount of detail. But first, we want to have a broad view of what the brachial plexus is. So first, I should say the brachial plexus is a plexus of nerve fibers that come together and then split all apart. And then they are going to end up giving off individual nerves coming off of this plexus. So the organization of the brachial plexus, it starts by being composed of the anterior rami of the spinal nerves C5 through T1. So we can actually see this on the far right of this slide. So from C5, the T1, those anterior rami fibers are giving you the components of the brachial plexus. Now, the brachial plexus for descriptive purposes is broken down into five different regions. We start most medially at the roots, we go to the trunks, divisions, cords, and then lastly to the terminal branches. Okay, so what the, the way that I remember this and the mnemonic that I heard when I was learning is the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches is to remember to drink cold beer. Okay, so roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. And we're going to go into more detail into each one of these components in the future parts of this video. But what I really want to point out here is that the organization for descriptive purposes is broken down into roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and then finally branches at the end. Now, when you get to the divisions, you are going to have a posterior division and an anterior division. That The nerves that come off of the anterior division in general are going to supply pre-axillary muscles. So this is muscles on the more anterior surface. Um, the posterior division is going to supply post-axillary muscles, which is going to supply things that are more posteriorly. And this is due to the embryo embryologic development um, of the extremities. Now, I do want to point out that no parasympathetic fibers are contained within the brachial plexus. Okay, so no parasympathetic fibers are contained within the brachial plexus. However, we do have sympathetic fibers. And just like all other sympathetic fibers, these sympathetic fibers enter the brachial plexus by going through the gray rami communicans to enter the spinal nerve. If you need a review on the mechanism by which sympathetics enter the spinal nerves, go back and watch the autonomic nervous system video. So as we start diving into the individual components of the uh, brachial plexus, let's start off with the roots. So the roots are coming directly off of the spinal nerves and they're being composed of the anterior rami of C5 through T1. Now there are going to be two nerves that come off of the roots. These two nerves are the dorsal scapular nerve and the long thoracic nerve. And what you're going to see throughout this video is whenever there's a spinal segment that corresponds to a particular nerve, it is going to be highlighted in red. And then we have the muscles that it supplies underneath. So our dorsal scapular nerve comes directly off of the C5 uh, root. So dorsal scapular nerve coming off of C5. 
Okay, and that is going to supply your levator scapulae and your rhomboid major and rhomboid minor. So that is your dorsal scapular nerve. You also have coming off the roots, this nerve running down, that is your long thoracic nerve. Your long thoracic nerve is supplied by C5 through C7. And that muscle is going to innervate the serratus anterior. So big takeaways from the roots. The roots are made up of the spinal segment C5 through T1. You have two nerves that come directly off of the roots. You have the dorsal scapular nerve, which is made up of C5, and you have the long thoracic nerve, which is composed of C5, 6, and 7 components. Those two nerves, dorsal scapular nerve, innervates the levator scapulae and the rhomboids, and the long thoracic nerve innervates your serratus anterior muscle. Going into the trunks, now we're starting to get the merging of some of these, those roots. So we're going to have a superior, middle, and inferior trunk. So the superior trunk is due to the convergence of C5 and C6, so that forms your superior trunk. Your middle trunk is the continuation of the C7 component of the brachial plexus. And then your inferior trunk is the merging of C8 and T1. Okay, so superior formed by the convergence of C5 and 6. Your middle trunk is just a continuation of the C7. And then your inferior trunk is made up of C8 and T1 nerve fibers. Now, there are only two nerves that come off of the trunks, and they both come off of the superior trunk. So you do not have any nerves directly coming off of the middle or inferior trunk. As the superior trunk is made up by spinal segments C5 and C6, which we saw above, these uh, nerves that come off the superior trunk directly are also going to have the same spinal nerve components. So those nerves are the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to the subclavius. So starting with the suprascapular nerve, once again, suprascapular nerve coming off the superior trunk. Because the superior trunk only has spinal segments C5 through C6, that is going to be the same spinal segment that correspond to this nerve. And it is going to innervate the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. So here is the suprascapular nerve coming down. Your supraspinatus sits above your scapular spine. Infraspinatus sits below the scapular spine. So there goes your suprascapular nerve innervating both of those muscles. And then you have the nerve to subclavius. The nerve to subclavius is going to go and innervate the muscle with the same name. So it is going to innervate the subclavius muscle. And once again, both of these um, nerves are going to have spinal sections C5 through C6 because they come off the superior trunk, and the superior trunk only has those spinal segments included. So that takes us into our next component, which is going to be the divisions and the cords. So we're jumping straight to the cords here, but I do want to point out with the divisions, there, for the divisions, you are going to have components that are going to run anteriorly and components that are going to run posteriorly. For your superior cord, or sorry, your lateral cord, you're getting components from C5 through 6 and also a component from C7. So the continuation of C5 and 6 and a, con a component of C7 to make up the lateral cord, which is going to now be spinal section C5 through C7. So the lateral cord has components from C5 through C7. The posterior cord, as you can see here, is receiving components from the superior trunk the middle trunk, and the inferior trunk. Because it is receiving components from all of the trunks, it is now going to have spinal components from all of the nerves. So that is going to be C5 through T1. So this is the, um, the largest, or the one that has the most spinal segments of all the ones that we're going to talk about. And lastly, your medial cord is just a continuation of your inferior trunk. So the medial cord is the anterior continuation of the medial trunk, and because the medial trunk only has spinal sections T, C8 and T1, your medial cord will also only have C8 and T1. Okay, now getting into the actual nerves that we need to know coming off of these cords. So we mentioned that we have a lateral cord, a posterior cord, and a medial cord. These are termed lateral, posterior, and medial due to the relationship to the axillary artery. So with that said, the axillary artery is going to sit right where this pointer is going through, it is going to sit anteriorly to your posterior cord. It is going to sit medial to the lateral cord and it is going to sit lateral to the medial cord. So it runs right through the middle. That is your axillary artery and these cords are named based off of the relationship to that artery. Now, going through the nerves that come off of each one of these cords. Each cord is going to have one or more nerves that are associated with coming directly off of the cord. So, 
We're going to start with the lateral cord. We mentioned that the lateral cord has spinal sections C5 through C7 as it has components from the superior and the middle trunk. So then one nerve that you need to know coming off the lateral cord is the lateral pectoral nerve. And again, because the spinal sections that correspond to the lateral cord are C5 through C7, it makes sense that C5 through 7 are going to be the same spinal components that form the lateral pectoral nerve. The lateral pectoral nerve is going to innervate the pectoralis major muscle, specifically the clavicular head. So the lateral pectoral nerve innervates the clavicular head of the pectoralis major muscle. That then takes us to our posterior cord. Our posterior cord is going to have three nerves that you're going to need to know. Two of these nerves are going to have the same spinal sections, C5 through C6. That is going to be your upper subscapular and your lower subscapular nerves. So it helps that both of those have the subscapular name associated. So C5 through 6, C5 through 6. The upper subscapular nerve is going to innervate the subscapularis muscle, or portions of the subscapularis muscle. The lower subscapular nerve is going to innervate the subscapularis and the teres major. Okay, so the lower subscapular nerve innervates not just the subscapularis, but also the teres major muscle. And lastly, coming off of this uh, cord, we have the thoracodorsal nerve. Okay, the thoracodorsal nerve is it, um, made of spinal sections C6 through C8, so it's different from the others, the other nerves on the posterior cord. So this one's a special one, C6 through C8 and it innervates the latissimus dorsi, and it's going to be running with your thoracodorsal artery. Okay, so C6 through C8 innervating the latissimus dorsi, and then that is going to be your thoracodorsal nerve coming off of your posterior cord. Now going into our final component of the cords, we have the medial cord. Okay, the medial cord is also going to have three nerves that are associated. And again, these are going to all have the same spinal section, C8 through T1. These nerves are the medial pectoral, medial brachial cutaneous, and medial antibrachial cutaneous. So let's start with the medial pectoral nerve. The medial pectoral nerve is the only um, nerve coming off of this medial cord that is going to innervate a muscle. It is going to innervate the pectoralis major and minor. So specifically for the pectoralis major, it is innervating the sternocostal portion. Because remember, the clavicular head is being innervated by the lateral pectoral nerve. So that medial pectoral nerve is innervating the pectoralis major, sternocostal um, head, and the pectoralis minor. Really important to note that the medial pectoral nerve, spinal section C8 through T1, are, is innervating both the pec major and minor. Okay, this is an important point when you see this nerve in lab. Then our next two nerves, the medial brachial cutaneous and medial antibrachial cutaneous, are going to supply skin of the same region that they're named. So medial brachial cutaneous, brachial refers to your arm, so that, that is going to be the skin of the medial arm, which means between the shoulder and the elbow. The medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve, antibrachial is the anatomical term for your forearm. So the antibrachial cutaneous nerve is going to supply the skin on the medial part of your forearm between your elbow and your hand. Okay, so that takes us through the medial cord. And once again, all the components off the medial cord have the same spinal section because of C8 through T1 because the medial cord is composed of the continuation of the C8 and T1 trunk forming the medial cord. Now, going into your terminal branches. For these terminal branches, you are going to have five terminal branches that you need to know. Starting from most lateral and working our way medially, that is going to be your musculocutaneous, which is off of your anterior division, your axillary and radial, which are off of your posterior division, your median and your ulnar nerve. Okay, so what we have over here, um, co color coded, is everything in green is coming off of your posterior cord. So one more time, everything in green is, is coming off your posterior division. Sorry, posterior division. Okay, everything else is coming off of your anterior division. So the way that we remember this is a mnemonic MARMU, MARMU the well. MARMU for musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar. That is one of the mechanisms by which you can remember the terminal branches of the brachial plexus. Now, these terminal branches are really important as they are going to be the nerves that are supplying the majority of your upper extremity. So we're going to take a minute to go through the different components, spinal sections, and then muscles that they supply. So let's start 
with the continuation of our lateral chord, which remember has components C5 through C7. So again, it makes sense that the musculocutaneous nerve here has the same spinal components. This is one of the major branches off of your lateral cord, your musculocutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve is going to supply the biceps brachii, the corcobrachialis, the brachialis, and the skin of the lateral forearm. So in terms of musculature, this is really supplying all of your flexors above the elbow. So the brachi biceps brachii, corcobrachialis, and brachialis muscles, along with the skin of the lateral forearm. Again, spinal section C5 through 7, because it is the continuation of your lateral cord, which is made up of these partic particular components. Next, let's jump into our posterior division, which is going to have two terminal branches, the axillary and radial nerves. Starting with the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve is made up of spinal sections C5 through C6. Remember, some of the other branches that came off of the posterior cord also had the same spinal section, C5 through C6. So this is a common trend when you're talking about the posterior division. Now, these spinal, uh, sorry, this axillary nerve is going to innervate the deltoid muscle, the teres major, and the skin of the lateral shoulder. So the skin of the lateral shoulder here. But the deltoid, teres major, or sorry, teres minor, and the skin of the lateral shoulder are all innervated by the axillary nerve, spinal segment C5 through C6. Going into the radial nerve, which is our last terminal branch of our posterior cord, the radial nerve is made up of all of the spinal sections, C5 through T1. So C5 through T1. There'll be one other terminal branch that we'll talk about, which will also have all of these spinal sections included. The radial nerve is going to do all of the muscles of the extensor arm and forearm, as well as skin of the posterior brachium, antebrachium, and dorsal hand. So this is doing the majority of the work in the posterior compartments of your arm. Now going into the median nerve. The median nerve is formed by a lateral and a medial root. So the lateral root is coming off of the lateral cord, which is seen here in this diagram, and then a medial root, which is coming off the medial um, cord of the brachial plexus to form the median nerve. So because the lateral cord has spinal sections C5 through C7, and the medial cord has spinal sections C8 through T1, when those two roots come together, they're going to form a nerve that is made up of the spinal sections from C5 through T1. Okay, so it is going to include all of the spinal sections that make up the brachial plexus. So the median nerve, like our radial nerve, has all of these spinal segments from the brachial plexus, C5 through T1. Now the median nerve is going to do a lot of the musculature in the forearm. So it is going to do six and a half of your eight muscles in the forearm. Okay, so six and a half flexor forearm muscles. It is going to do five muscles of the hand and the skin of the palmer hand, specifically the lateral components. And again, this will be something you touch on much uh, more as you get into those components of the course. And then lastly, we have our ulnar nerve. Our ulnar nerve is made up of the continuation of the median medial cord coming down. And because the medial cord was made up of spinal segment C8 through T1, it makes sense that our ulnar nerve is also composed of C8 through T1. It is going to do one and a half flexors of the forearm and the rest of the muscles of the hand. So the, the ulnar nerve does a whole lot of muscles in the hand, some of the forearm, whereas the median nerve does a lot of muscles of the forearm and some of the hand. And then you're going to have skin of the palmar um, medial surface of the hand supplied by the ulnar nerve. So one more time, when we're talking about our terminal branches, one of the mechanisms by which we can remember this is the mnemonic MARMU. MARMU standing for musculocutaneous, axillary, radial, median, and ulnar. Remember that the axillary and radial nerves are coming off of the posterior division, while the remainder of those nerves are coming off of the anterior division. One last thing I want to point out. When you're in lab, you'll hear uh, the talk about looking for the M. The M refers to the structure that you will see from the anterior division. If we follow the components of the anterior division, if you go from musculocutaneous to a lateral root, medial root, and ulnar nerve, then that is going to form an M. So a lot of times when you're in lab, you might hear the instructors talking about locating the M and following the medial portion of that M to identify the median nerve. But that's just one of the uh, many tricks that you can use in lab to help identify these specific nerves on a cadaver. Now, 
really briefly, I'm going to show you how I would quickly draw the brachial plexus on test day. I think this is something that you can do repetitively over and over again, and is a great way to study. So we're going to take just a moment to do this. And I apologize in advance. I'm trying to draw with a mouse, so this may not go very well. Um, okay, so let's start off with our roots. So we have C5, 6, 7, C8, and T1. These are the roots of my brachial plexus. We know that the C5 and C6 roots come together to form our superior trunk. C7 is going to continue as itself. So here goes our trunks. So C5 and 6, C7, then C8 and T1 come together to form that inferior trunk. Okay, now we know that there are two nerves that come off of the roots themselves. One comes off of C5. This is my dorsal scapular nerve. And then another comes off of C5, 6, and 7 combined. This is going to be my long thoracic nerve. Okay, so dorsal scapular and then long thoracic. Those are the two nerves coming directly off of the roots. So dorsal scapular coming from C5, long thoracic coming from C5, 6, and 7. Now as we're going to our trunks, off of my superior trunk, I know I have two nerves that come off. One is the nerve to the subclavius muscle, and one is my suprascapular nerve. So those are the two nerves that are coming off of the superior trunk, and again, the superior trunk is made up of spinal section C5 and 6, so that's going to be the same spinal components that are made up that make up these particular nerves. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw um, the parts of the posterior division, and I'll try to do this in a separate color. So as we're co continuing more distally, you're going to have a branch of the uh, superior trunk going into your middle trunk, and this is going to form part of that posterior division. Same thing is going to happen from your inferior uh, trunk going into your middle trunk. That is going to help form that posterior division, which is now going to be composed of all of the spinal segments within this nerve. Or sorry, within the brachial plexus. Then we're going to have a component of C7 going to join our superior trunk. That is now going to be forming um, that lateral cord, which is now C5 through C7. Okay, so now everything in red is going to be our anterior division. Everything in blue is going to be our posterior division. Okay, now as we continue distally, we set off with the lateral cord. We are going to have one nerve we need to know. That is the lateral pectoral nerve, lateral pectoral nerve here. Okay, then for now, we're gonna, that's the only thing we need to know coming off the lateral cord. Coming off of the um, medial cord, we are going to have three nerves. So I'm just going to draw three quick little lines. I have the median pectoral nerve the uh, uh, brachial cutaneous and the anti-brachial cutaneous. So I'll we'll just put C here for cutaneous. Now, to finish up the anterior division here, remember we're gonna have those terminal branches. So let's draw this out a little bit more. And then those terminal branches, the medial and lateral cord are going to join together by giving off roots to form the median nerve. So there goes our median nerve there. Most laterally, we have our musculocutaneous nerve. And then medially, we have our ulnar nerve. And if you look closely, this is the M that was referred to earlier. So the ulnar, the medial root with the median nerve, and the lateral root with the median um, musculocutaneous nerve make up that M that you can see in lab. And those are all parts of your anterior division. Okay, well now that we have the anterior division done, we have to finish up our posterior division. So our posterior division is going to continue distally, and we are going to get two terminal branches. We are going to have the axillary nerve, and we are going to have the radial nerve, which are two terminal branches off of your posterior division. And now we can't forget about the things coming off of your posterior cord. There are three nerves. You have a um, in inferior superior or sorry lower subscapular nerve a superior subscapular nerve and then a thoracodorsal nerve which is also known as your me medial or median subscapular nerve so those takes that takes us to a very brief drawing of the brachial plexus now when i'm doing this um, for class or for the exam this is really a fast drawing i just draw two quick little lines come through and i make my x anterior divisions come around 
and I'm done. So this is a very, very brief way of drawing the brachial plexus so that we can get a general idea of what you need to know for the exam. But it is important to know what all of the components mean. So as you're drawing this out, take the time to do one really detailed diagram and you can start doing some quick diagrams just to really um, get you going to where you need to be. Okay, now one point that I did not pick up on while I was in this course because I was too busy learning the little details is that there is a very specific regional distribution to these nerves. So regional distribution. If you think about your dorsal scapular nerve, that dorsal scapular nerve came off of the roots directly, specifically C5. That is going to be doing all the muscles within this square. It is doing your levator scapulae, your rhomboid um, your, and both your rhomboids, so your rhomboid major and your rhomboid minor. Okay, so that is being done by the dorsal scapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve, which came off of that um, superior trunk, is doing the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. So again, every muscle in this region is being innervated by the suprascapular nerve. The axillary nerve is doing two muscles, the deltoid muscle and then your teres minor. Okay, so deltoid and teres minor, both are located relatively close together in space, so it would make sense that they are both innervated by the same nerve. And then I want to point out that the lower subscapular nerve, in addition to the subscapularis muscle, is doing regions of your teres major, which is located right here. And then your thoracodorsal nerve is doing your latissimus dorsi, which is located here. Going through some of the anterior components um, are regions of the arm that are regionally distributed. Really everything between the shoulder and the elbow in the anterior compartment is being done by your muscular cutaneous nerve. So all the muscles between your shoulder and your elbow in the anterior compartment are innervated by the muscular cutaneous nerve. And all the muscles in the posterior compartment of the arm and the forearm are being innervated by the radial nerve. Okay, so there is a very clear um, regional distribution to these nerves when it comes to musculature and to the skin. So I do recommend as you're going, progressing into later components of this course, just take a step back and think about the region of distribution as opposed to learning all of the individual muscles that are innervated by a particular nerve, and it will help you out a lot. So one more time, really think as you're working through this course, big picture, regional distribution, so that way you aren't having to memorize every single detail that comes up within the course pack. Okay, now coming to the end of this uh, video, we are going to talk about two clinical correlations that are gonna be important. The first is an upper brachial plexus injury. So this is referring to an injury of the C5 or C6, C6 roots or the superior trunk. And that is going to um, display as Herb Duchesne's paralysis. So again, this is an upper brachial plexus injury, meaning it's coming from the superior um, trunk. So when this happens, you are going to lose spinal segments C5 through C6 throughout the brachial plexus. So that means that any nerve that is supplied by C5 or 6 is, or any muscle that's supplied by C5 or 6 is going to be disrupted. And when this happens, you're going to have a pretty um, clear uh, clinical correlation that you're going to be looking for. You are going to see an individual with their arm medially rotated. Their elbow is going to be extended. This is because they've lost most of the flexors. So therefore, they no longer have the ability to flex their arm and the extensors are operating independently. Their forearm is going to be pronated and their wrist is going to be flexed. This is often referred to as the waiter tip position. So think about when you a waiter holding their hand out behind them for a tip, for instance, that this is the waiter's, uh, waiter's tip um, distribution for Herb Duchesne's paralysis. Now, if you, you ask yourself, how is it possible that you get this particular form of injury? Well, one of the main ways that you can find um, upper brachial plexus injury is during childbirth. If the head is being stretched while the shoulder is still lodged, this can cause stretching of the superior um, portions of the brachial plexus and that can cause this injury. Another way is if someone was to fall from a very high height and they were to land on their head and their neck went sideways, that would also cause the same stretching motion and then that would cause this Herb Duchesne's paralysis. So the way that you might see this in a question is either a child during childbirth and then they present with this waiter's tip position or it could be someone who has fallen off of a ladder and landed on their head and then they present with this um, form of paralysis. 
But again, this is an upper brachial plexus injury, so this is going to be spinal segment C5 and 6 that are damaged. So if you work your way through the brachial plexus and mark out every nerve that has a component of C5 and 6, you can oftentimes determine exactly what the presentation is going to be without recognizing that this is Herb Duchesne's paralysis. The um, last clinical correlation that I want to cover briefly is going to be a lower brachial plexus injury, and this is going to be Klumpsky's paralysis. So lower brachial plexus injury, this is going to be C8 and T1. C8 and T1 makes up that medial cord, and remember that medial cord is supplying parts of the musculocutaneous, or sorry, the median nerve, but it's also the component that supplies the ulnar nerve. And what I want to point out about the ulnar nerve is the ulnar nerve is doing some of the muscles of the forearm, but it's doing a lot of muscles of the hand. So when you have this lower brachial plexus injury that leads to Klepsis paralysis, you are often going to get this claw hand appearance. Appearance, And this is because many of the nerves, or sorry, many of the muscles within the hand are being supplied by the ulnar nerve, which is not receiving innervation if you have a lower brachial plexus injury because you have damaged spinal segments C8 and T1, which make up the ulnar nerve. So this is more than just ulnar nerve damage. That is, so let's keep that in mind. But one of the reasons why you get this claw hand appearance is because of that ulnar nerve damage and then wasting of the forearm muscles because of the median nerve damage. Okay, so lower brachial plexus injury, which is Clumsy's paralysis, is caused um, often by pulling too hard on someone's arm over their head. It stretches the inferior components of the brachial plexus and can cause tearing. Right? And that is going to result in Clumpsy's paralysis, which results in the claw hand appearance, which we see here. And with that, that will bring us to the end of this video.